It's, it's a real pleasure to welcome back Professor Mary Aldbean to the Q community for the third time. For those who don't know, Mary's the pioneer of complexity leadership theory, the most cited approach to the leadership and complexity topic globally. Uh, a key part of her framework is the crucial role that adaptive spaces have been found to play in effective change. These spaces can be created by using anything from liberating structures to design thinking to communities of practice. Uh, Mary joins us from Texas, where she's Professor of Leadership at the TCU Neely School of Business. Uh, this is going to be a slightly different kind of session. We're going to dig more deeply into a single area that's come up previously, the issue of how to spread innovation, which presents such an ongoing challenge right across the NHS and beyond, and also what the pandemic response tells us about this. Uh, after our first two Zooms, we felt this issue around spread needed to be addressed more fully. So over to you, Mary. All right. Well, thank you for having me back. It's always great to be with the Q community. And I enjoy talking about these topics. So I'm looking forward to a good conversation. As we were teeing this up, one of the questions that I got in the email was, how has the current situation influenced what I'm doing in my work? And obviously, what's happening right now is complexity. So. I think we want to start, we'll, we'll get to the spread issue, but we want to just start real briefly with saying, well, how does the pandemic and the global coronavirus crisis have relationship to complexity leadership? So here's what I would say. Um, I think that this is an exact example of what complexity leadership theory demonstrates and why it's so important for us to understand it as leaders. So if you look at what's happening, as I started to watch the pandemic, and because I'm an emergence person, I knew what was coming. And luckily I, had a, a, I have a colleague from China who gave me heads up warning. So I was really watching to see, and I knew that we were gonna go into lockdown here well before other Americans did. So we were able to stockpile, which was kind of nice. I could even warn my daughter in London to get stuff. So we were way ahead of the curve on that. But if you look at what was happening in the world, what would complexity leadership theory say should have happened? So here's what I would say. When it became clear, I'm gonna use the US example, when it became clear in January that China was having a potential pandemic and our administration was warned about it, what they should have done right then was go into action, immediate action. A complexity leadership approach would say, the immediate action will be what do we need to do in, in, in order to have a good operational response? So many people think that in crisis or in complexity leadership, we don't have the execution and the operational response. And that's because early on, when we were trying to understand this work, we weren't focusing on that. But the truth is you need to have a good operational response. So they should have immediately looked at the things they should have been preparing operationally, testing, PPE, um, how they were gonna coordinate at a federal level. And yet none of that happened. So in our work, what we've seen over and over again is that when leaders are faced with complexity, they go to an order response. And what happened here, and I think in many countries, was a classic order response. An order response to complexity is to deny that it's there. So deny it's happening, think it's gonna just settle down and go away, or things are gonna go back to way, the way they were. The other part of an, a classic order response is you think that the current systems and structures are going to be able to let you address the issue. And that's precisely what happened here. We found that order response in our data from our research in healthcare from the period of 2007 to 9 when healthcare in the US was experiencing a lot of crisis. We went into six healthcare systems to look and see what leaders did and, and overwhelmingly they went to an order response. So I have to tell you as a complexity person that was really disheartening to see. I kept watching it going, oh, I just, I, on the one hand it validates what we've seen in our research, but I was so frustrated and really feel like this is a call for much more need for us to understand complexity. All right, so they did an order response when you really need a good operational response of execution at the federal level. And then the second piece of what should happen is you understand that you need an adaptive response. So an adaptive response is having good operational combined with entrepreneurial. And the entrepreneurial will help you to drive the adaptive responses. And those responses should be on a local level. 
So we have seen that. And I, I'm sure you've seen that. You've seen it in NH, NHS. There are examples of it where you have entrepreneurial pockets that arise in the face of the pressures that are coming in. Those entrepreneurial pockets then generate local innovation and local adaptations. So complexity talks about you need to have the global, but you need to have local as well. So in the example I'm using, you need a federal response, but then local too. And I think that this has really illustrated the power of the local. So everybody is experiencing this everywhere in the world. There's the local response and the local tends to be more appropriate to the situations that we're in. So I can talk about that in just a second. What I'm telling leaders, and I'm working with some healthcare organizations right now, is that we're in a unique opportunity because what's happening is that organizations are loosened up. So when you have a complexity event, which is a complexity pressure coming in, it loosens up a system for change. And you, we were just talking about this in our prep for the call. So organizations loosen up, there's a window of opportunity. Well, what that is is adaptive space. So when we see this and we're seeing the speed with which things are happening and the changes that are seemingly happening overnight, it's classic complexity. That means that adaptive space has been opened up. But as I tell leaders, that window is only gonna be open for a certain amount of time. So right now we have a rare, very, very, very rare and unique opportunity because adaptive space is there. Windows for change are opened up. Those are going to close and the system will lock back in again. When we've talked about complexity in the past, we've been talking about systems that are mostly closed and locked in. How do you get change in those? We have in this environment right now, the opportunity, because adaptive space is opened, to drive change, to make that change stick, then what we have to do is get it in in the form of new order. So we have to institutionalize it or get it embedded so that it becomes part of the new system. So we can talk about that a little bit, but let me um, just quickly make a couple more points on this. And I think this is setting up where we wanna go with the spread. So in our case, we had bad, bad um, order response. We did not have the effective execution of the operational at the federal level. We had tons and tons of local adaptations. And so that part of it works. People jump in because they say, things are different, we have to act. We had the people making masks, so lots of people sewing masks. We have PPE and a scramble for PPE. We have testing. And in fact, I said to one of the doctors I in our healthcare program, before this all happened, as it was starting to come, I said, you know what we're gonna see is drive up testing. But I, I thought actually the vans would come around and they would come to people's houses. I was kind of thinking of the Uber or the Uber Eats model. I didn't know we would go to drive there, but I knew it would be something like that. So this idea of drive up testing. Um, and then on the other local, what's happened is businesses, schools, universities have all made the call. It wasn't a federal call to shut down. Our university shut down long before our government said that we should shut down. And now what we see is our leaders attempting to think that they have control over the situation. So I'll go back to our president again, putting out edicts. So when you have this classic kind of way of viewing leadership in these situations, you think I can just make an order or an edict and somebody is gonna to listen to me. So this morning I wake up to the news that our president wants to open schools again. And I'm thinking about that going, well, he can say that all he wants. It's not gonna be up to him. It's gonna be up to the parents and the schools. They're gonna be the ones who decide when it's safe enough to go back. Just like we have our governor saying, you can open businesses. And yet some businesses are not feeling safe to open. So it again shows that even the idea that people are in hierarchical positions can control, they really can't. They have to push in these systems just like everybody else. Um, as far as things that are changing, they're what we have seen, and it's really actually pretty exciting with our healthcare leadership programs, we've been talking for a long time about complexity and about innovations and changes and the ways that we're gonna practice. And one of them here we call telehealth. Our physicians have rejected that repeatedly. Absolutely no telehealth. Telehealth is horrible for you. Um, doctors need to be in the room with the patients. We need to have our hands on them. And yet, like that, we've gone to telehealth. And actually, physicians are loving it. 
I was on a Zoom call yesterday with a group of physicians. One of them said, oh, I gotta go see a patient. So he jumped off the Zoom, went on Zoom with his patient, came back and joined the call. He's working at home. So these kinds of things I think are here to stay now. And there's been conversation. Can we get it to stay? From the healthcare administration standpoint, they say it can only stay if our payers decide that they're gonna pay, still pay for this. Temporarily, the payers said, we will pay for virtual visits but it's a question of whether that's gonna happen or not. So getting it institutionalized meaning, means that it can't just be the physicians, it has to be, and, or the, the patients, the parents, it has to be um, the, the system also, the payer system that would lock it into place in order of response. And then one final example of that, a big thing that we're seeing, I've been working on strategic planning with one of our local healthcare systems, and the president and the CFO, I was sitting between them as we're doing the strategy and they're saying, yeah, this has been really surprising how well work from home works. This remote work idea, we've always resisted it. So physicians were resisting telehealth, but administrators were resisting remote work. And now they're saying, this works much better than we thought. And frankly, this can save us massively on our footprint. And we wouldn't have had to build all those offices and the CFO is going, yeah, we can save money on this. So lots of things that were seemingly impossible before have now just happened. And that's a classic kind of complexity example of how a pressure from a system can open up adaptive space and can bring in new order in a pretty fast way. So I know that you all have some examples. Um, our operational wasn't very good in terms of being able to coordinate, but Diane, you had an example of a 24-hour rapid response. So can you share that one with us? Yes, yes. Yeah, well, thanks very much for that, uh, Mary. Um, an example from here um, in the NHS has been an adaptive response at a national level uh, involving work across different organisations, disciplines and, and professions. Uh, as you say, at, at great speed and, and with great success. Uh, and that's the uh, Testing Methods 2020, which was launched to capture innovation in and around COVID testing in our response to try and uh, rapidly increase the number of tests undertaken. Um, and so this was a way of tapping into the knowledge and expertise of the entire laboratory testing scientific community, uh, trying to get input from individuals and organisations from industry, the NHS, academia, whoever uh, could contribute something. Um, and it was the first time uh, an open innovation approach was taken uh, with this community on a, a nationwide basis. So, so that was a first. I think uh, what was noticeable also was the process of establishing the crowdsourcing platform that was used. That would normally take four to six weeks, probably at least in normal circumstances, happened in 24 hours, which is just truly remarkable. Um, and the, the team behind this platform was a collaboration across the NHS, Department of Health and Social Care and Industry. And again, um, seeing such productive and speedy collaboration of, across those players, uh, I think is, is, is just truly remarkable. Um, that works ongoing. It seems to have formed a community that are, are moving on to uh, answer other questions around testing. Uh, so there's some real momentum there, um, sharing of resources. Um, it, it, it appears to have been a, a huge rapid success that is still ongoing and has actually spurned another um, uh, use of crowdsourcing uh, to look at capturing a clinical innovation that occurred through this crisis. Uh, so uh, th there's something that was coordinated at national level that has been really uh, both rapid and very successful. And the fabulous thing about that is you see that there's some entrepreneurial and local work, mm -hmm. but then if they can coordinate at the, at the national level, that can get it institutionalized. So that is exactly how we describe this should work. So I think um, the way to, to think about this too is the things that have happened and that are working are systems that are poised for change. So why did I know or think that there would be some kind of drive up testing or something related to that? When you look at trends and you look at and see where we are, then you know that there's technology available and we could do it. 
So it's these kinds of things, the systems that are poised for change, that are the ones that become the biggest adaptations. Things that are not easily available, those are ones that are not gonna make it into the system. And I think that has parallels to how we focus on spread. So when we get to the idea of how do you spread an innovation, uh, the characteristics are exactly what we're describing. If it's a poised system, it's going to be easier to get it to change. And if you have pressures that are driving it, then you've got something where timing can happen and it can just go into place. The ones that are going to be harder are ones that are farther out. So things that we don't quite have the technology or the capability for yet. And people might say, well, we need to do this. But what you have to do in thinking about how to spread is if it's so far out in the horizon, it's not gonna be something that you can get done. You have to make the progress or the steps to get there. And I think that um, in the words of Winston Churchill, never waste a good crisis. <laughs> so when you think about these kinds of things, we have a crisis right now, what are the things we can slide in that we're already poised for change and you've been trying to drive this all along, well, your opportunity window is there now. Adaptive space is opened up. So see how you can get those things in. But it can't be a temporary kind of thing. It has to be something that becomes institutionalized and really becomes permanent. So let me give you one more example of that, which is Zoom. <laughs> so this is kind of funny because we're on Zoom right now. Everybody's on Zoom. People who didn't know about Zoom before know about it now. Um, but as I was working with this healthcare system on strategic planning, they originally planned to have their retreat, an all day retreat on May 8th, and it was April. And I said, uh, guys, this isn't gonna happen on May 8th. We need to start thinking differently. So they said, well, what can that be? I said, well, we'll just do virtual. They said, how in the world can we do that? I said, Zoom. They had never been on Zoom. So this is in April. So then I said, okay, our next meeting is on Zoom. I set up a Zoom call for them. They got on it and they weren't afraid anymore. They're like, oh, okay, this isn't so bad. I get this. So then I said, well, let's set it up on virtual. We'll do Zoom. The challenge was, they said, we'll do an all day. I said, you can't do an all day on Zoom. That's gonna wear people out. So then we had to spread it out. We had to do multiple sessions and had to figure out the logistics. We had 32 people. So last friday and then again this afternoon we're going to do our second one but last friday we did a zoom call with people in one room and then people in another room because we're doing social distancing they're in the building and then we're all in masks we have the the rooms talking to each other on zoom the president is sitting next to me he's never seen this technology so he's not sure it's going to work it worked beautifully as you see and like that everybody is used to it now and they say I get it. This is great. I'm not afraid of this change anymore. And I see how this can benefit me and how this can work for us. So that kind of thing is what you need to be thinking about in terms of how you tip it over into the system to get them to adopt it. But Zoom itself, if I was working at Zoom, I'd be really worried right now because they are the most vulnerable they've ever been. And here's why. Now everybody's on to them. So before they could fly under the radar, they had a technology, they had an innovation, they were driving it and trying to spread it. Well, in trying to drive it and spread it, they set it up and they were controlling it, if you will, right? So Zoom as a company was able to determine what features they wanted in it, how it was gonna work, how they were gonna drive it out. But now everybody knows Zoom and the competitors know Zoom. So if this is something that competitors can easily replicate, this could be the death for Zoom. At the time when they seemingly are most successful is when they are most vulnerable. So this is important also in terms of thinking about change and how you drive change. If you're a change agent and you're trying to get things done, you fly under the radar. But once you get on the radar, you can get attacked. They can come after you and start attacking you and shoot you down. So there's a luxury of being a change agent that's kind of like floating around, along and getting things done but we call it the snowball effect or amplification. When it gets on the radar, it's no longer in your control and things can go pretty crazy and pretty chaotic. So you can think about that relative to spread as well. Does that make sense to you? And do you have questions on that or do you see parallels to how it works at NHS? 
Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, to, to most, if not all of those questions. No, that, that was a fascinating set of reflections. I'm still um, thinking those through. Uh, what, what struck me was that opportunity you've described where things are almost unfrozen and, and we need to change things before they refreeze. And we need them to refreeze because we need that stability, that institutionalizing of, of something. But the question is of, of what? Um, so I, I think that freezing and unfreezing is, 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 is a useful analogy. Um, I think uh, I, I think that's really uh, really helpful. And uh, trying to think, what can we take forward from this crisis that can be beneficial? Um, and you've mentioned some of those examples around video consultation uh, and, and, and those examples which, which echo our experience here. And how can we? maximize the benefit from those innovations and, and the spread of those innovations um, while also retaining um, some of the good things that we did before as well. Um, when we've been doing things so quickly, they've been done in different ways in an adaptive way, um, which is good in this situation as we move forward. Uh, I think we do need to reflect on um, what has been done and what needs to be done in, in, in the future in terms of maybe getting the, the best from the past and the best from, from the present. Um, but, but certainly from a spread point of view, it, it's a unique time and I'm very keen that we reflect and we learn as much as we can from what's happened and what is happening and what we need to help happen in the future. Uh, to, to maximise the benefit from this. Um, and and I, I think the example I gave um, of, of the testing just shows that if, if there is a will to do something, um, that things can be done so well in terms of collaboration. If there's that burning platform, that desire to do something, to set something up and, and have it running in 24 hours is, is, is truly remarkable. Um, so these things can be done in a certain set of circumstances. And that's the key in a certain set of circumstances. So when, where there's a will, there's a way. Things can get done. What normally happens is we don't have the circumstances for that to happen because the system is locked in. So let's take the, what you just said and ask the question, how can we maintain the current environment of adaptive space? So we know now that we have adaptive space opened. How can we look at the elements of what's open and what's available to us right now and think about how we can keep those open so that it doesn't lock in back into such a rigid system that we can't make these changes. So I'm going to put that one on you and say, what do you see as the elements that are open now? And Matthew, you can jump in on this too, but what do you see as the elements that are open now in terms of adaptive space and what do we need to do to maintain them? Um, yeah, I, I think some of the, um, uh, if, if I jump in first and then Matthew can go next, um, I think some of those elements are that uh, shared, very um, immediate shared purpose. I, I think within the NHS, we probably all have the same implicit shared purpose here to serve uh, the patients in the community. Uh, but, but in a crisis like this, it, 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 it's so apparent, it's so explicit. Um, and I think that's had that uh, joining together across boundaries, whether it's within organisations, across organisations, across, you know, um, different departments at a national level. Uh, it, it, it's had a unifying effect, I think, in, in terms of that uh, willingness and, and strong desire to work together. Um, so, so that's something I'd, I'd, I'd offer. Um, Matthew, is, is there anything you want to just add? I was just going to say this, you know, such a stark contrast from there was that there was oper there was a simulation in 2016 Operation Cygnus, which pretty much showed exactly, you know, the, the, the problems with PPE supply, all the overwhelm of the, of the system. But it was it was kind of it was never published. The uh, the recommendations, the 26 recommendations never passed on to kind of care leaders. So it's it's interesting that, that you know, we, we did have the opportunity to adapt and and seemingly didn't take it. Uh, it. It still hasn't been publicly um, made available, I don't think, by the government. It's still uh, classified. So I think those are great examples. I want to offer some additional ones. So if we look at what's really the difference right now 
is I believe that the wall of resistance is down, right? Mm -hmm. That's really the big change is that normally we have walls of resistance. And I often talk about that as the brick wall. But right now those walls of resistance are down. And the interesting thing is the examples. So the examples I gave, one of them was the administrators resisting remote work. The other was the physicians and the providers resisting telework. Well, on each side, so these walls of resistance can be from anywhere in the system, but they've come down now. And with those walls down, we can make connections that very quickly we can get things done. So a question would be, in a normal environment, how could we keep some of those walls of resistance down? Mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts on that? <laughs> and, and Mary, is that walls of resistance in, in terms of change or in terms of specifically working together or, or both? All of it. Well, see, change comes from working together. Mm -hmm. So when you ask that question, your stories have all been about people coming together and collaborating in ways they wouldn't before, right? So yeah. that's what's needed. And yet we don't do that in normal environments. And that's in part because of the way we work with each other. We don't see the shared purpose in the same way. So the question would be, how can we continue or maintain that? I'm gonna put it on you because I think that you need to think through it. So what thoughts do you have on that? Yeah, well, Mary, I think it's a very good question. And uh, one that we, uh, I, I think uh, as a health service need to give some um, serious attention to. Uh, I, I guess it's it's down to, um, as you say, working together is, is about relationships um, and uh, how do we enable the conditions for us to continue to work in this more open, collaborative way. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I think uh, that is, is going to depend to some extent from locality to locality, um, but, but with that common aim of more open, more collaborative, more trusting, I guess, uh, ways of working together uh, around an explicit shared purpose. And that's precisely it. Open, trusting and shared purpose. So if we want to look at what are enabling conditions, now we're into how do you enable spread? Well, mm -hmm. enable spread is about enabling leadership. And so this is the piece that many people don't understand. How do we do enabling leadership? Enabling leadership is the leadership that creates the conditions for change to occur. So it's creating the conditions for the, the adaptive process to happen. And those conditions are allowing people to come together and collaborate. But then as a result of the collaboration, you have to open up the rigid infrastructure to be able to accommodate change. So you were mentioning that earlier. I have it somewhere in my notes as we were talking on the pre-call. Um, so there's the enabling piece, enabling leadership, but mm -hmm. you also refer to it as the receiving piece. And yeah. the receiving yeah. piece is how do we receive this change into the system? This is where people in positions who run the operational system need to think very differently. And what they need to do is they need to look at it as instead of just being resistant and having our locked in infrastructure, what we need to do is figure out how we can be flexible to accommodate change that comes from the system. So I'm going to say it again. The biggest piece on the receiving end is to change your mindset. Your mindset as an operational leader or an administrator should be how can we be accommodating of change that needs to come into our system to make us adaptive, all right? So I'm gonna give you an example of this. In one organization that we've been working with in healthcare, we've been training, we, we're now in the sixth cohort of, change, of training them in models around this kind of thing. Now, interestingly, we do complexity and the, the leaders who've listened to it know the complexity piece. The participants just get a lot of org behavior, basic management, collaboration kinds of topics and content. But the administrators really get it. And so what's happened is, is that we have been able to create connections between the physicians and the providers and the administrators to work together to accommodate change. Administrators know that their healthcare system needs it, 
but, and they've been struggling to try to get it from the providers, but providers have also been trying to push things into the system that administrators have been resistant to. Now what happens is the first session that we have for a cohort, we have people from the finance office and from the administrative side coming in, they sit with the providers, but it's not just physicians, we also have administrators in the room in each cohort, so we build the network that way. But they'll come in and they'll say, listen, we want your ideas. We get that you as physicians don't know how to frame up things that work for us, that you don't understand how the, the money side of this works and where we're coming from in terms of our strategic initiatives. So we're gonna provide you support. So if you have an idea, we're gonna get with you and we're gonna help you build a business case around it. We will help you do the financials around it. So right from the beginning, they're pulling these ideas. They're not just, they're not resisting it and they're not pushing saying, go do it. They're actually pulling the ideas into the system. So then I point out to the, the providers in the room, why are these guys here? This sounds really nice. They're gonna help you do this. Why are they doing this? And they all sit there going, I don't know. And I say, because their job is strategy. And as strategy, they want strategic change and they want initiatives and they are rewarded for that. So they're rewarded based on getting these things into the system that make it better. So now you've got your, your rewards and incentives aligned and you've broken down some of that resistance so that the recipients of the change are actually partnering with the individuals who are trying to champion it. Mm. So, so that's a, a pull for the change, a pull for that, be it an in innovation or a change of some sort. So generating a, a pull for it rather than a more traditional, here's this innovation, this bright new shiny thing everyone wants here, you should have it because it works here, you should have it or you do need it, go and use it. Um, so instead of that kind of push model, it's, it's more a, a pull model, which is uh, clearly what we need to uh, try and uh, uh, encourage within the system. Yeah. As you see, it's a different mindset. Yes. I think really what we're talking about is a mindset difference in terms of what my job is. And the mindset difference comes from multiple sides, from all angles. So from those who are in the administrative positions, let's say the finance people, the administrators who are focused on money, the strategy people, the change in the mindset for them is, we need this stuff, we, instead of us waiting for it to come and then rejecting it because they don't frame it up right, we understand that they don't understand how to frame this. So, mm -hmm. but we know they have ideas. So now we're going to jump in and help them understand how they can get those ideas into the system. Also acknowledging some of the ideas aren't going to work. So we're going to say to them, this one isn't going to work. And here's the reason why, or this isn't going to work right now, but we'll work with you later if the timing works for it. Okay. So that's the mindset change on the part of the administrator and the, the operational leaders. But the mindset change on the part of the individuals driving the change is for physicians, they can't just focus on patients. They can't just focus on their personal needs. I need this equipment. I need you to approve this. They need to frame it up in a way that fits the business case and the strategy for the organization. So we spend a lot of time teaching them what is strategy? What, what is the strategy of this organization? Why do you need to know it and care about it? We bring the CEO in and the other high level administrators to share that with them and have a conversation around it so that they understand how the administrators are thinking. And then we also say, you have to understand what business is and what a business case is and why it matters. These people aren't being evil by saying, we're gonna reject your ideas. They're trying to keep the organization healthy. So you're focused on patient health. They're focused on organizational health. How can you align these things so they work together? Yeah, sorry, Mary, and this is what's happening in the adaptive space. So what about the enabling leadership that's required to have this happen? Because that doesn't just happen by itself, does it? Right. So that, that mindset change opens up the system for adaptive space. So everything I'm doing is describing um, how you create adaptive space in an organization, because adaptive space is allowing people to come together with different ideas and work those ideas together to refine them. And then how can we get them to link up and connect to aggregate into a, a bigger scale change? Mm -hmm. So 
This is all about adaptive space and enabling leadership. I would say that our leadership program that we run with them and the work that we do with the, the providers and with the administrators is that we are creating adaptive space, but transferring that into the organization. And everything that's happening is an enabling leadership kind of role where the individuals who are, run, who are in the program or involved in it understand what enabling leadership is. And that enabling leadership is creating the conditions that allow the spread to happen. Yeah. Does that make sense? It makes sense, yes. Yeah, no, that's really helpful, very helpful indeed. So the other thing that you mentioned is the local piece. So you, what you said, Diane, was it works here. And so it works here, so we're gonna force it on someone else. And Matthew, mm -hmm. you asked this question in one of the pre, in the emails you sent me for the pre-work. I think the other thing is that what we need to understand is because something works in one place doesn't mean it's gonna work in the other place. Mm -hmm. So scaling doesn't mean my idea has to be implemented everywhere. Scaling means that what we understand is we're trying to drive some kind of adaptation in the system. And that adaptation can look different in different places. So I'll give you an example back to COVID. Um, I hear these conversations going on all the time. There's this discussion of we need to open schools. We need to open up the country. We need to do these things like a, a, a global edict. But the reality is all of this should be local. There's, it's an ongoing interactive effect between global and local because every place is a bit different. And this, the parallel to this, if we look at a country like the United States or if we look at the UK, we see that there are different locals, right? That same thing happens in an organization. It's exactly the same thing. So I'm sitting here in Fort Worth, Texas. Somebody else is sitting in Boise, Idaho. They're experiencing something very different from what we're experiencing here. And the edict that needs to come for us doesn't mean it's the same edict for Boise, Idaho or someplace in rural Montana where they don't have any cases. They don't need to have a massive global response on this. They need to have local adaptation. So it's really important, and if you use this COVID crisis as a parallel for it, and you look at what you're experiencing in your own local, wherever you are, you'll see that there is a, there's a need for that local, but then also some kind of coordination at the top, but that coordination at the top should not be an edict coming down for your local. And what's gonna work in your community isn't necessarily gonna work in another community. Oh, it's, it's, it's a balance between the two, isn't it? If you need some um, national direction and then the local implementation or the local adaptation. Um, and I suppose how that might work with spread is if, if a particular way of working or a particular innovation works in one setting, um, it needs to then be adapted and utilised in a new setting and that there needs to be a learning process in that setting as to how the innovation might be of benefit to that particular context. Exactly, so what you wanna do is you wanna share information. So you yeah. want to allow people to hear what others are doing so that they get the idea and then it influences their thinking. It becomes information, but yet they're able to make their own local adjustments. So I'll give you another example that we're experiencing um, in, in our profession, which is the Academy of Management. So we have the Academy of Management, which is our academic professional organization. I think there are 20,000 people in it. So we have a, a meeting every year, a national conference. That conference is, had to be canceled because it was gonna be in Vancouver in August. So the AOM was asking people, what do we do about this? Well, we have all these different divisions. And the individual divisions were saying, we can't possibly all do a virtual conference. It's, we're not gonna do it. So, then there was a whole lot of dialogue and each division was making their own decision. What should go virtual? What works for you? But here's the key thing. What the division said is, yeah, we can handle our own stuff, but we still need coordination from you. The coordination we need is technology. So we'll do virtual, but we can't do technology. So we'll tell you what we'll do, but you provide the technology platform for it. We don't want to have anything to do with that or registration. We're not gonna handle registration or money issues. You guys handle that. So those are the operational kinds of things that you need the coordination from at the global, the more federal or global response, and then the local adaptations need to be made. 
And I, I think that's a really key thing in terms of understanding spread because many people on spread say, oh, I have this innovation or this idea and I wanna push it out and you should take my idea. No, that's not, that's not it at all. It's really more, what is your idea trying to accomplish? What kind of change is it trying to drive? And then how can others have parallel change that will get the system to where it needs to be? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really, uh, really interesting, really useful, and, and uh, is, is uh, quite consistent with the thinking that we've been developing within the NHS Horizons team uh, around spread and scale. Um, so it, it, it's good to hear that consistency. <laughs> So I've attempted to answer some questions. I can go more specific if you like. So what I'd like to ask now is specifically what, what questions do you have? Um, how can I help more in terms of getting people who are attempting to spread and scale the kinds of challenges they're facing? Um, what more specific answers would help you? Can, can I ask uh, something, Mary? I we don't really talk so much about enabling leadership, do we? You know, people are talking now about adaptability. People are aware that this sort of adapt adaptability, this quick fix mentality is so important. And yet it maybe hasn't fully dawned on people that there's a, a kind of new onus on leadership or a new style of leadership that's needed. So I don't, I don't know if there are ways to kind of spread that awareness that that's an element of this adaptability. So that it's more likely to kind of endure, you know, over the coming months and years that because without that, presumably it, it's more likely to kind of fall away again. It's a perfect question for bringing that back up, Matthew, because I know we wanted to hit this. So um, you have to help me with this. There are a couple of things you mentioned. So you mentioned, I think, liberating structures and you've mentioned convening systems. Right. And there might be some other things. And so those are, are things that we hear about that are really kind of nice to have sure what it means overall. So here's what I would say to you. All of those things are exactly right, but what they are is enabling leadership. So what we need to do is understand that what we're talking about is a different kind of leadership that is called enabling leadership. We can just use that term. Because um, if I don't use the term people, we need to get some stickiness around a term or an understanding. And so what enabling leadership is, is consistent with what I said before, it's that mindset shift. So if you're gonna do enabling leadership, what you need to do is shift your mind. And what is the mindset shift? It's that my role is to think about how I can facilitate and enable adaptation, emergence, change and all of these things driving for improvement. So some kind of improvement to make our systems more resilient so that when things are coming in and they cause us to have to change, we have resilience in the system. So enabling leadership positions the system for resilience. It's a mindset shift and it's really about complexity thinking and it's about emergence. So if you're an enabling leader, in your head what you're doing is saying, how can I enable emergence? How can I create the conditions for emergence? Emergence is this adaptation that helps us get to new order. Okay, so to do that then, I'm in my head thinking as an enabling leader, I'm using complexity thinking and I'm understanding how change in a system gets done, that it's this interactive kind of stuff in the face of a pressure and that a pressure, when a pressure comes, it's gonna cause us to have to adapt. So how can we create our, our, or how can we um, open up adaptive space or operate in adaptive space, adaptive space to get these things done? Now, what you also understand as an enabling leader is sometimes we don't need adaptation. So if we don't need adaptation, then we wanna run it as efficiently as we can. So in situations, and maintain status quo when we're doing really well, keep doing it but then be looking out ahead to say, what's coming? What are the trends? What's happening? Every time I teach complexity, I teach trend analysis. And so I always have them do trends and then I, I get them really uncomfortable with them. And I start talking about what's happening in the trends in the world so they get uncomfortable. And I say, you guys say that you don't want this generational stuff or you don't like this discussion of gender. Well, I'm sorry. 
the whole world has changed on this. Young people are talking about gender in ways that we haven't talked about it before. Things are changing and you can try to hold on, but it's not going to be your choice soon. So you've got to be looking at trends and thinking about things that are out there so that if a change like this occurs, you're ready and, and agile to be able to react in it. So to bring it down to the really micro level then, everybody in NHS should be thinking the big forces that are happening in the environment. What's going on that's gonna be different or change and how's that gonna pressure our organization? Um, with those pressures then, what are we gonna to have to do differently? And how can we do that? On a very local level, we can do that in our local environment to say, here are adaptations we can make. But on the more macro level, the macro leaders need to be also looking to say, what are these big changes going to be and how can we make our system resilient so that if we have to, we can adapt on the fly. We can be very quick. So I think this, this situation is a good opportunity to look and say, where did it work? Where were we able to adapt? Where did it not work? And we have problems in our system and what do we need to look at there that fell apart and how can we address that in the future? So Matthew, did I get it? If you, do you have more comments on it or questions or thoughts on enabling leadership? I mean, maybe I'll see if Diane's got anything because she, she's actually working on a big report about this or will be, you know, once COVID has passed. Um, as, as I alluded to just a few minutes ago, I've been looking at um, uh, spread, scale, ad adoption, and pulling together uh, existing information literature models, including uh, your own, Mary, which have really been very useful and informed our thinking uh, tremendously uh, to produce, as Matthew says, uh, something that was due out about now, uh, but will be out uh, at some point in the uh, future, um, which it does talk about needing a, a new mindset, a new approach, which is, is uh, very much in, in, in line with some of the things you've been saying. Um, and I, I think uh, it, it's, it's the direction that we've been moving in anyway within the NHS, uh, a greater understanding of complexity and interdependencies and the fact that um, in the past people have said, oh, this innovation's great, it works here, therefore everyone just needs to use it. Um, and that doesn't happen. We know that. We know that there's the uh, innovation curve uh, with the, uh, uh, the, the the chasm that we get after the early adopters. Um, and, and I think we have a better understanding now as to why that approach doesn't work, why that scenario occurs and, and what we need to do about it. Um, so uh, as you've been outlining the uh, role of adaptive spaces and enabling leadership are, are key to uh, what we need to do in, in, in trying to bring about um, uh, essentially a complex change in a complex adaptive system. Um, and uh, you mentioned in your last webinar, I think that uh, uh, w often people in healthcare are being asked to make complex changes in a, in a system that isn't set up for allowing change never mind complex change um, and, and therefore it's not surprising that these uh, innovations don't spread um, i think we've been thinking well why don't they spread i think we should be saying well it's not surprising they haven't spread really now that we understand uh, 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 more about complexity and what we've been asking people to do because change um when it comes to spread is, 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 is about those relationships. It's about uh, people asking people to change their routines, asking people to change what they do at work, their work behaviors, the way they do things, the way they interact with others and make, uh, you know, um, make them question um, aspects of uh, their profession and all sorts of things. It, it can be really either complicated or complex. Um, and these are the kinds of things I think we're now understanding much better and then realise that in order then to achieve spread on, on the kind of scale that we need and I think particularly so after and uh, during and after the situation we're in at the moment um, that we need a, a more nuanced approach that we need this deeper understanding of, of what uh, we need to do to help enable uh, spread to occur rather than to drive it or to push it and uh, we have to be there with uh, enabling leadership and trying to generate adaptive spaces to enable 
um, people to take up the innovation, to ideally pull the innovation rather than have it pushed on, on people. Um, so uh, what, what you've been reflecting on today and using the COVID examples has been really, really helpful and has helped, I think, cement some of our thinking. That's great. So I would say to summarize what you just said and what we've been talking about is that enabling leadership is really focused on enabling spread. And to enable spread, you need to have adaptive space. Mm -hmm. So the whole focus of enabling leadership then is understanding when and where you need adaptive space and then working to open that up. And that can come from both sides. So we tend to think that the brick wall or the wall of resistance comes only from the operational, but it doesn't. It can come from the, the other side as well. So um, the physicians, the providers can be the ones who have the wall. The operational people can be the ones that have the wall. But essentially what you're trying to do is take that wall of resistance down, create adaptive space, that adaptive space creates the opening or the opportunity for people to connect and engage in different ways around a common purpose, some kind of, of shared purpose. And that shared purpose doesn't mean that they have a, a specific goal. They don't, they're gonna come from many different angles and they're gonna have many different ideas on it, but they understand that together they're trying to accomplish something that's gonna benefit the organization. So you need as an enabling leader to understand how to open up that adaptive space when it's needed, where and when, and then you need operational systems that are flexible and accommodating of adaptive change. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Mary. I think, yeah, I think maybe we'll leave it there with that great summary, which, and it, it, you know, it's so useful to see how this, what we're learning from the pandemic can kind of stay with us around the role of, of that kind of leadership uh, and adaptive spaces. So um, thank you again, Mary, for this, this third uh, visit to, to help Q Communities Improvers learn from your framework. It's been so informative. Um, and thank you, Diane, as well. And we look forward to your report too uh, when, it, when it sort of restarts. Okay, lovely. So, uh, and my thanks, Mary, as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to both of you, it's been fun. Okay, well keep safe 